Hi everybody, I'm Bree the Plant Lady and today I am at the J.C. Ralston Arboretum in Raleigh, North Carolina. I was just coordinating with Elizabeth, the um, Children's Gardening Program Director. We are going to do a hydroponic setup for her summer classes and uh, summer camps. And now I have a few minutes before I have to meet some people, so I thought that I would take you on a quick tour because this garden changes so much from week to week and there's always new things to experience. So let's get walking. I love that they are really starting to develop more rain gardens, bog gardens here to collect more of the water and utilize it in pockets. And they've got some beautiful calla lilies in bloom. I have one that's as tall as me at my house but these look great mixed in with these different Carexes. And you can see there's even some Baptisia down in there growing out of the water, mixed in with some um, irises that have just finished flowering. Well, I'm so happy to see that the trial garden is planted. This is something that gets done yearly um, for testing new genetics, primarily of annual plants. and. Right here in front of me is an area of the All-American Selection vegetables. And I actually am trialing several of these as well, which I'm really happy about. I have this Everleaf Thai Towers that I've just planted. That's from Pan American. And there's some cool looking tomatoes. There's Dark Star, Marzito. These are all Pan American. They do a great job with their home vegetable breeding program to increase disease resistance, um, especially in tomatoes for growing in the Southeast. Here's one that has a promising name, Early Resilience. And then in my favorite collection is the Chef's Choice. And this one is the green variety. I actually got to visit the breeder of Chef's Choice when I was in California a few years ago. And that entire series of tomatoes is awesome. You can look at how healthy they are. They are the best slicers. One thing I love about trials is like the not being emotionally connected to the plants, which I don't do well at my house, but here. It's so like, I would generally never recommend growing terrania um, in full sun <laughs> like this is full sun y'all there is no shade out here in this field but it's just going to be a really great thing to see how these actually perform and maybe i'm wrong so i'll take you through an area of the ralston that i haven't shown on videos before and this is the new conifer garden so they have two conifer collections both of which are part of the conifer society and of course it includes more than just conifers there's things like ginkgos right here uh, lots of cryptomerias even um, things like japanese maples you see here in north carolina in central north carolina i should say um, we have to really grow our conifers uh, above grade because we do get so wet in the winter and then you have to irrigate all summer. So we're not exactly the climate where a lot of conifers are growing natively. Um, so it's kind of funny to zone bend by growing conifers here. Of course, we do have our native taxodium. There's a taxodium there and they're so graceful and beautiful some of the varieties of conifer that do really well exceptionally well i think are cunning hamia right here um of course juniperus right there and cedrus this is a nice low growing cedrus oh this is cedrus deodora feel and blue well i can tell you from experience this gets a whole lot taller than that <laughs> but it sure does look nice right here. One of my favorites that I grow at home is Platycladus orientalis. And this is a cultivar called 
Beverlyensis, and I just think it's so cool because of these interesting cones that it has. It's a big plant. More Taxodiums here. There are so many cool varieties and they really do have different textures. So this is Jim's little guy. So it's more of a dwarf habit. And then right here we have Crazy Horse. And this one I don't think is like, doesn't get gigantically large, but you see the foliage is uh, much, it's a much different orientation you compare the two. I know that this video quality isn't great, but there's a lot in a cult of our name. So as we come out here, we have the monocot garden. And the main distinction here is these are all plants that are monocotyledons, meaning they only have one vein. So when they germinate, they only have one leaf. Um, so this is a pretty broad collection of plants. It includes things like hedicium and asparagus, which is blooming right here, um, crinums, all things in the Poaceae family. So all grasses are monocots. Um, palms, here we have, what is this? This is a sable miner getting ready to flower. Agaves fall into that category, and here's a gigantic agave that bloomed last year. Bamboo, it's a monocot. Juncus, you know, daylilies. There's so many common plants. Iris, yuccas, allium. Sky's kind of the limit for monocotyledons. And I just think it's a really cool way to educate and distinguish um, plant categories for people who are visiting the Arboretum. Everybody has a little plant nerd in them, right? Of course, lilies fall into the monocot category. Here's one called Sunny Morning. Isn't that so sweet? It's the cutest little flowers. And bananas which we, we do live in a great climate here in Zone 7 for growing hardy bananas. Uh, I've seen some pictures recently of people's bananas that didn't even die to the ground this past year. Um, you can see these old stalks aren't coming back, but pups emerge from the ground. Bananas take up a lot of real estate, so be prepared if you're growing those. And look at these giant alliums. Don't they look amazing against a very hot, dry Carolina blue sky? So here is the yurt. This is where the children's gardening programs are held when they're in person. And this is where we will be setting up a hydroponic system, which I'm really excited about. This is also the main area where food is grown at the Arboretum. They are battling a lot of bunny rabbits. Like, it's pretty scary how many bunnies they have. But of course, I think one of the most popular plants right now is the pineapple guava. It's been in flower for a few weeks. It's so beautiful. It's a nice broadleaf evergreen for our climate and you can actually eat these petals. They taste quite good. Mm, and they have really nice texture. They're so sweet. Of course, the bees love it too. I am here coming up to the fragrance of the moment coming from our native Magnolia grandiflora. And you can see how huge these buds are. <laughs> Between the magnolias and the gardenias blooming right now, everything smells really good. But here are some flowers that are open. So I've seen my first hummingbirds just this morning at my house and one of their favorite plants is butylon, the flowering maple, I think is what it's commonly called. And you see just a few have started opening, but there's tons of flower buds to come. This is quite a stand here. This is a plant that I don't have at my house and I need to get. There's my good friend Tim, greeting visitors, answering their questions. He's a wealth of knowledge. If you ever get to come to the Arboretum, he is one of several incredible staff members that 
will knock your socks off with the knowledge that they possess. I'm lucky enough to have known Tim since way back when, 2005, when we worked together at Plant Lights. So we're walking along the perennial border and the Pensamans are doing their thing, which is partly why I'm obsessed with them. I believe in the Arboretum for my obsession and need to collect every Pensamon that's ever existed. This is really like one of the main borders that, you know, identifies the Ralston Arboretum. And it's been planted for a really long time. Doug Ruren, who is uh, a staff member here, and Edith Edelman, a really talented designer, did this like, gosh, 20 years ago. And you know, the thing with perennial borders is they do have to be managed and updated, but this one has really stood the test of time. I just wanna show you this pretty pocket. Look at those beautiful lilies. I love them mixed in with the nebida, the orange and the purple together is really, really quite striking. This is that Nicotiana Salta Blues that I got last time I was here as cuttings. They, so far, they look great. I just love these tubular yellow flowers. So do hummingbirds, by the way. So I'm hoping that my cuttings will root. So far, so good. The, everything in the mist house that I that I gathered from here week before last, or actually it was last week, um, looks absolutely terrific. So very excited about that. Look at the tamarics. This is a plant that I covet, but doesn't necessarily love living here, but I think it's so pretty. It does really well in Colorado. <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> Of course, this verbena, I don't know if that's still named verbena. I think maybe this had a, a genus name change. Sometimes you can just walk a garden and just enjoy it for the fact that it's pretty, right? Ooh, that's a nice echinacea. I also don't see a label for that, so I don't know what variety, but it sure is pretty. And I'm thrilled to see the crinums are in bloom. Mine aren't flowering yet, but this is a much better established clump. And I have to ask my good friend, Jenks Farmer, who is the, the crinum man. Um, this is crinum bulbospermum. I see a label. And I'm not sure if that's Ellen Bosanquet or which variety that pink one is. And the Fafia is blooming, which is one of my favorites. And I love their bee hotel. I really need to make one of these. I love the scale of this. It's so grand. And they do replace the stuff in it every couple of years. You know, they put in some fresh bamboo stalks and, you know, refresh it so that it's healthy. But there's lots of bees coming in and out. This is especially important for solitary bees. So there you have it, some signage to give you more information on bees and why little creations like this help sustain a lot of different species. Well, here we go. Oh, good grief, it smells so good. Oh gosh, I love gardenias. Can't wait for mine to flower. Mine are not in this much sun, so that's probably the problem. This is a variety called Leon. And the hydrangeas are doing their full on thing. We have Hydrangea crucifolia here with Lilium Red Alert. Look at that combo. Isn't that just so striking? Well, I know enough to know that none of the labels that I see are for this plant. I think this is what I used to call Syningia, but I think these Jesneriads have also had name changes. But isn't this just the coolest flower? I mean, it's just a plant that I think is worth growing, regardless of its name. <laughs> it's what you say when you don't know the name of a plant. So we're getting into the geophyte border. 
um, which is all about plants that have underground uh, storage organs. So plants that have tubers or bulbs, and that's how they define this entire border. So you have more crinums, you have Aristolochia, which is this kind of scrambling ground cover. Um, more Jesneriads, let's see. This also does not, nope, it says Syningia Solovii. Okay, so I think that one that I just showed you is still a Syningia. Of course, um, Dahlias fit into the geophyte category. Um, rain Lilies, things like Zephyranthes or Habranthus. And this border is, is really remarkable because it just always has something new flowering in it. I love all these little um, oxalis. I actually have those naturalizing in my driveway cracks. So sure, it might be considered, you know, a bit weedy. I've seen a lot of people posting first dahlia flowers. Mine are still in bud, but here they have one in flower. It's one of the dark leaf varieties. And, you know, I think asparagus is a plant that doesn't get enough recognition. There's so many species of asparagus that aren't the asparagus that we eat. And they're really heat and drought tolerant natives. Um, I think usually to South Africa. But here's a really cool one that I think would do really well in cut flower arrangements as a foliage element. As we come up here, ooh, look at this one. Again, I don't see a label. Gosh, isn't that pretty? I need that. <laughs> so here we're on the roof um, of their educational building. And I will admit that over the years, I have been kind of like, I do not understand this obsession with crevice gardening. When we live like 100 feet above sea level, like we don't have rocks. Like I, why are we constructing these false environments? But this year, I will say this crevice garden has knocked me, uh, has knocked my socks off. I'm totally impressed and I sort of get it now. Like I'm not gonna build one at my house, but I can certainly come here and enjoy it and see the value in these plants that are probably mostly like native to the Rocky Mountains and you know, maybe the Swiss Alps and different places like that that wouldn't ordinarily ever tolerate living here in central North Carolina zone seven. Well, as I make my way out of the beautiful Ralston Arboretum, I hope that you have enjoyed this quick tour. So I've walked about and maybe shown you some areas that you haven't seen before. And I just wanna give a shout out to one of my favorite trees, which I have planted in my very front garden. This is Celtus sinensis Green Cascade. And um, my goal is to have this tree grow up over my front porch area, just like it is here on this walkway. So you can see that I take a lot of inspiration from this garden and try to apply it very literally in my own home space. And I hope that you will do the same. So thanks so much for watching everyone.